Welcome. I'm Sebastian Mafud, and you're listening to WCAT Radio, the on air wing of En Route Books and Media, bringing you the dulcet sounds of Catholic wisdom. Well, a good Monday afternoon to you, and welcome to an all-new edition of Faith and Sport on the Carolina Catholic Radio Network, AM 1270 WCGC. We're also streaming live at at Carolina Catholic Radio. I'm already excited about the broadcast. I can't even get my words straight. CarolinaCatholicRadio.org and the Carolina Catholic Radio app. And now, without further ado, let's go to your host, Dr. John Aquaviva. Thank you, Chris. Hey, yeah. folks, thank you for joining us today. However, wherever you are joining us from, this is Faith in Sport. I'm Dr. John Aquaviva. I teach exercise science at Wingate University, but I take the afternoon and Monday off to deliver this show to you. In fact, I am combining two of my true loves, my faith and the world of sport, and I've developed this show. I'm not the first one to do this, but I think I'm the first one on Carolina Catholic Radio. Uh, here's what we're going to do today. Uh, we have our hit or miss with Carlos Herrera. Carlos joins us just about every week to uh, have this conversation on something that is good or bad within the world of sport, especially as it relates to character, faith, and ethics, as we try to tie a lot of our conversation into. Uh, we have a special guest today. It is Matt Burke, former NFL lineman, Super Bowl champ, and current CEO of Matt Burke and Company. He's going to be joining us in a few minutes. In fact, after that conversation with Carlos, be sure to stick around for both of those conversations. After the break, we'll do weekend headlines. We have a quick Q&A with Dr. A, and we have our Cathlete of the Week. I understand that Carlos is on the line. Yes, he is. Let's bring him on right now. Carlos, welcome back to the show. How are you doing today, buddy? Doing great, John. Happy to be back, Dr. Aquaviva. This is great. Um, buddy, uh, what was your hit or miss of the week? So, and I'm not sure if you covered yours yet, but I will have to say is the miss of the week is if you were betting on the Titans Chief game, uh, apparently that cost ten million dollars to betters. Oh, is that right? Well, tell me what happened. So uh, they basically, the Kansas City was uh, the overall line on that, and I'm not a sporting uh, uh, expert by yep. any means. Yeah, uh, like some of the people that we both we know. know. <laughs> um, they uh, they were predicting that uh, Kansas City was going to win. Right, and yep. apparently at the very end of the game, they had uh, with one minute left, all it had to do was kick a field goal. They would have um, beat the the spread. I think the eight point spread. Yep. They ended up missing the the snap. They ended up losing the ball. Uh, they were winning, and then the Titans came back and scored a touchdown and <laughs> changed the game in a matter of a minute and a half to the point where. Uh, all the money that was bet on the Kansas City Chiefs got turned around because the Tennessee Titans ended up winning that game. But this the is last minute and a half. But Carlos, this comes back to a couple things that not only every gambler knows, but simply every fan knows, is that it's a heartbreaking endeavor, right? If you're a fan, <laughs> no, seriously, if nobody ever has been upset by a loss or been really excited by a win of their favorite team, I would say they're not really a big fan. Wouldn't you agree with that? I've <laughs> Absolutely, and I know the gambling is relatively new to the legal component of this, so there are a lot more people being in, are, are involved in this, and it's one of those things. It's not as simple as it seems. No, it, no, it's not. In fact, you know what I'm going to do is, uh, if I have a chance before we get out of this conversation, I'm going to read from the Catholic Catechism on what the Church says about gambling. In fact, I think the Church calls it gaming in the Catechism. Um, but yeah, that were you watching that game by chance? No, just watching the clips on it. I just there was a lot to watch this weekend. So having a two year old son, uh, I don't get the luxury of watching uh, like I used to. <laughs> no, I get that exactly. In fact, <laughs> I remember a couple years ago, like I'm a big University of Michigan fan, and they were going through this awful, awful like uh, two or three year period where they were losing about half of their games. And for the team that has won more games in the history of college football than anybody, even having a sniff at a 500 years, not good for them. 
And I remember my brother would constantly text me like, are you watching this? This is awful. They lost again or they're losing again to nobody and stuff. And, and you know, I would literally have one baby in one arm, one in the other. And, and Alicia was saying to me, can you change the diaper of the third one? And so, yeah, you know what it's like. You're in the midst of this upbringing of this tiny childhood and, and of course, or this tiny child. And, of course, at two years old with Max's, with you guys, he can get into everything and anything at any moment. And you can't even blink for yes. hours at a time. Yes. All right. So go ahead. No, just saying that that was there was a lot that happened this weekend. There's oh. so many things that were. Um, if you're an NFL fan, uh, the uh, MLS. There's a Cup winner in Seattle again, first time or second time in four years. I mean, the, the women's soccer team. They just finished their their year beating Costa Rica six nine. So there's so many things that were oh, yeah. are, are happened this weekend. What did, what did you get? Well, mine was a mine was a hit, and I had a particular angle on this. Now, did you? Okay, last night's game was between the Minnesota Vikings and the Dallas Cowboys, and I'm pretty sure at the time the score was zero uh, zero, and it was only about a, a eight or nine yard play. I think they're at the about the one or two yard line. Yes, uh, saw it. Yeah, and then the one handed catch by Kyle Rudolph, I thought was outstanding, and it was interesting because. Uh, my wife was, you know, I, literally she was doing laundry. She was folding the laundry, and I was actually folding it with her. And I looked up, and I said, oh, my gosh. And he caught the ball with one hand, brought it in like he had glue on his hand. Yes. It was so impressive, and he kept both feet in. And so yes. I thought that was – And he didn't bring another hand to catch the never, ball. He <laughs> caught it and went to the ground with just one hand holding the ball. That's exactly yep. what happened. And that's part of the reasons it was so impressive. And, you know, this sounds like an overstatement, but I believe this is absolute truth. You know, sometimes in baseball or football or basketball we see a great shot. But in football and baseball in particular, we often see like a catch, and we could literally go, man, that was the best catch ever. But yep. the next week – you know, you could be watching ESPN Sports Center, and they could show you another catch, and you would go, well, that's just as good as the other one. It's just a little different. And this is an example of that. But here's what I would say about this catch, and you would probably agree. You're not going to see a better catch in the NFL than that. Yeah, it's just, that's one of those. This, but we've seen him, right? Who was uh, was in the Super Bowl? It was the Giants. Uh, I forget the guy's name. Yeah, the who caught that the, one, or was it the Arizona? Caught the one-handed yeah. grab, the ball against his helmet. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> in the key in the Super Bowl, under key huge. possession, and against his helmet. Oh yeah, that was crazy. Yeah, that was that was definitely one of the more famous catches because of what it led to it helped them beat the Patriots. Yeah, it was. I think it was fourth down and long. Yeah, it was. It was just the the situation of the game. Turning point of the game for sure, but you know one of the things I wanted to do is bring in. Now I know you think about this all the time. Uh, Pope Pius the Twelfth's comment on how beautiful sport is. Now before I put you on the spot and ask you to give the, give this quote from 1945, Carlos, this is what he said, and I mean this. This is the first thought I had, or I shouldn't say the first thought, but as I was reflecting this morning, what am I going to make my hitter miss of the week about? And when I said this catch by Kyle Rudolph from the uh, Minnesota Vikings. I thought of this quote because I use this in a talk that I give when I talk about the beauty of sport. And yep. this is what Pius XII said back in 1945. Athletic activity can help every man and woman to recall that moment when God the Creator gave origin to the human person, the masterpiece of his creative work. And I think about not just what you know, the ability to play sport, which is a beauty in and of itself, right? This is one of the ways that we glorify God, right? We yes. use our body in a positive way to Absolutely. build community, to get our bodies in better shape and so forth. But the last part of this comment, Carlos, the masterpiece of his creative work, it, I always, in this presentation I give, I always have these um, images of great catches being made or great plays being made. And you would appreciate this. When I give that talk, one of the pictures that I show is a professional soccer player doing a bicycle kick to score a goal, right? And no, truly, that's one of the most beautiful things you'll ever see, not just in soccer, but in sport. Wouldn't you agree? Yes, yes. All right, it, go ahead. No, just the ability to hit. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and, and in hockey, there's the guys who can do just some of the most amazing things with their body on skate. Oh, yeah. With the little puck, right? Like Absolutely. It, and, you know, one of the beautiful things about the encyclicals and some of the writings is when you, if you, most people don't read them, 
right? No. But when they describe also like the value of work and the value of sports and the value, it's written in some of the most beautiful language and the beautifully crafted how everything has such a positive role for us as humans to develop. And most of the time what we see is all the negative stuff. That's know? right. No, that that is good. Even though both you and I, uh, we go back and forth on this, and I probably have, like you do, more hits than you do misses. And in fact, sometimes I lean toward the hit for obvious reason, right? You kind of want to be positive. You want to yes. lift people up and so forth. But I do think, just like we talk about in the church, that you can't have goodness without sin, right? There has to be a contrast of sort, and this is one of the things that we talk about on the show, and in particular why I bring you on, and you're always good at that. Now, let me, hey, before you go, brother, uh, you stole my thunder, because you know what was going to be one of my trivia questions to you, is Carlos, uh, who won the MLS final yesterday? But you actually <laughs> knew that. Now, okay, now let me ask you this then. Uh, who'd they play, first of all? They played Toronto. <laughs> And what is the and what is the Seattle team nickname? Well, it's the Sounders <laughs> is the name, but I don't know what the nickname is. Well, that's what I mean. The Sounders, that's their nickname, right? Yeah. Or their, their mascot or whatever. Oh, uh, Carlos, you nailed all of that. I should not have questioned a true soccer fan. Well, you know, it just happens to that. I did see and focus on that yesterday because of the, there was a stunning goal. Did you did you see any of the goals? Any of the highlights? I did not see it. I just read oh, about it this one morning. One of the last goals was basically two kicks. A fullback kicks the ball straight down the field. This five foot seven guy outruns this six foot two guy, and basic. I mean the the stature size difference, and he just runs onto the ball and kicks it past the keeper. And it's just two kicks, and it was in the goal, and it was one of the most beautiful plays. And the whole stadium awesome. went nuts in Seattle. They're big fans, and they filled. They play in the stadium that the football team plays which has a tremendous amount of seats, and it was packed, packed of soccer fans. That's awesome to hear. How many people would you project were at that final game? 65,000 oh. is the capacity of that That's stadium. That's awesome. That's awesome. Yeah. It really does show. And, and as a big soccer guy, you must – truly, that must be a great stat to hear because all you hear is about, you know, how popular football is and basketball and all these other major sports, but – it's not far behind now. I mean, they, it, 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 I think, surpassed, I want to say, basketball or it, baseball. One of the two, it passed one of the three big ones as the one of the growing sports. Um, as far as, as, and, as far as like attendance at a game. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And it is true that while um, football or no, hockey and basketball, for instance, are major sports. One of the reasons that they don't get any more than, in general, around 20000 to a game is because it's so difficult to see the ball. The ball's smaller, and, yep. and people don't like to be that far away, whereas the soccer ball, in essence, is the same size as a basketball, but this, it's spread out over and it's easier to find the ball. And that's one of the things about hockey is if people can't see the puck, they, they don't really have much interest in it. And yeah, yeah. that's the whole <laughs> Yeah, I know. In fact, a couple of times I've been at a hockey game and I cheered because the people down in the other <laughs> section were cheering before me. It was like a, you know, it was like a an echo of sort. I was like, oh, they cheered really loud. They must have just scored. That's funny. But That's no, that funny. is that is really good about uh, Seattle, and that is a true haven for soccer, isn't it? They've really built built themselves oh, a great they, team. It's impressive. They they talk about and and there was an article recently about the value of some of these sport uh, the, these soccer franchises. But they are now like tripling and quadrupling in size um, in terms of value, and it just goes to show you the growth that is happening. But Seattle and Portland, the two of those are some of the diehard soccer um, uh, cities right now, yeah. uh, along with Los Angeles. And the two Los Angeles teams apparently are also booming. So That's it's awesome. Impressive. Awesome. Well, this is a good segment, my friend. I always enjoy talking to you about, about the, all this stuff, including our hit or miss of the week. Thank you, and then uh, we expect to have you on again next week, buddy. Great to be a part of the show. Love it. And uh, you have a great guest coming up, so very excited to hear that as well. Okay, buddy. We'll talk to you Take soon. Bye-bye. All right, that's Carlos Herrera. He's our certified uh, soccer coach, and he joins us just about e- each week to do our hit or miss. In a minute, folks, we're going to be joined by Matt Burke, the co-author of All Pro Wisdom, The Seven Choices That Leads to Greatness. Uh, he's a former NFL lineman and Super Bowl champ. He's going to be joining us in one minute. Um, one thing I wanted to mention was last week's guest, Haley Maria, the 
uh, great gal and, and uh, apologist for the faith, and certainly somebody that has really spread the faith to a lot of people that she speaks to and, and um, speaks with and so forth. And I thought she was a great guest. She has that book, What Though the Odds, uh, Overcoming a, a Lot of Adversity. You know, she was in a bus accident. People told her they wouldn't, she wouldn't walk again and so forth. She went through a great deal on that. So I want to remind you what her story was and why she was on last week's show. But during the show, in fact, I think it was after she was on, Chris, I was talking about the headlines of the week. And one of the things I said was, now that the Patriots lost to the Ravens, there are no more undefeated teams, right? Yeah. That's what I said on air. And before the show was over, God bless her, Haley emailed me and said, John, actually, that's not true. The San Francisco 49ers are still undefeated. And, of yeah. course, after this weekend, they're still undefeated because they didn't have a chance to lose. Yeah. Like your Washington Redskins. <laughs> yeah. So neither team lost this weekend. Yep. So my apologies to any San Francisco fans, but I feel funny saying that because I mean this, Chris. You spent your whole life on the East Coast here, right? That's right. In, in the southern East Coast. Um, I, I was born in the Midwest and uh, you know, came down here to the uh, Mid-Atlantic and so forth. But not once in my life, and I mean this, have I ever met a San Francisco 49er fan. <laughs> I mean, think about it. When was the last time you saw somebody have a 49ers hat on or San Francisco? But, of course, you're going to see that more now because they might be headed to the Super Bowl and something else. They're undefeated. They're having a great year. But my apologies to the three listeners that we have that are San Francisco 49ers uh, fans. Because you are undefeated, and I said there was no more undefeated team. So mm-hmm. let's switch gears. Um, by the way, folks, it, you are listening one of three ways. So make sure you pass this on to anybody. You're listening to Faith and Sport, and there's three ways to listen. AM 1270, carolinacatholicradio.org, and you can hit Listen Live, or you can go to the Carolina Catholic Radio Network app and then download that, which is free. That's right. Which is quick. Chris, how long does it take to download an app? In just a few seconds. Literally. And then, so once you do that, you hit listen live, and then next thing you know, for free, you're listening to Faith and Sport here on Carolina Catholic Radio. That's right. <laughs> Quality radio for free. <laughs> Can't beat that. <laughs> well, listen, let's move on to our next segment, and it's our next guest. It, he is Matt Burke. Uh, I mentioned he's a Super Bowl champ, and he's the current CEO of Matt Burke and Company. He's a 14 year NFL player, and he's joined us today. Matt Burke, welcome to the show. Hey, how are you? I'm doing all right. Hey, listen, you retired in 2012. Ex- technically, it was 2013, correct? Correct, yeah. Uh, okay, and it was right okay. after you guys won the Super Bowl with the Ravens. And we beat the San Francisco 49ers. That's right. Apparently this year, you just said are going to the Super Bowl. So, yeah. Well, no, I said they may go to the Super Bowl, but I wouldn't be no. surprised. But um, I thought that, yeah, that was a great victory. And uh, and what, in my, I, you you know, you might have heard this in a, a as you got on, or maybe just before you got on, but my team, I was born and raised in Detroit, Ann Arbor is right outside of that. My team is the University of Michigan, and of course, my favorite team's coach is the coach of the Ravens' brother, and that would be Jim Harbaugh is the University of Michigan coach, and John Harbaugh, and my guess is he was great to play for. He was awesome, and I applaud you for not being a Detroit Lions fan, because that's (laughs) basically a sentence to a life of suffering and disappointment. (laughs) Um, John Harbaugh is an awesome guy to play for, was was basically the reason why I left Minnesota, which I played in Minnesota for 11 years. I was born and raised a Vikings fan, got to play for the Vikings, didn't really, wasn't really looking to leave, but uh, the Ravens called, so I decided to just take a look and I was very impressed with John. He's a uh, he's he's a Catholic man. Yep. He's a man of faith. He's a man of virtue, and uh, enjoyed my four years playing for him. Obviously, we you know, winning the Super Bowl helps. Um, you know, professionally it was great, but personally as well, John and I had um, had some great conversations over the years about faith and family, and, and we'll go to mass together every Sunday before games. So he's uh, he's a stud. That's awesome. In fact, in fact, for that alone. This is great to have you on the show. What you just said about John Harbaugh and faith and so forth, I love that. I, I knew a lot of that information about John Harbaugh. I know he came from a Catholic family and so forth. Now, now before we get into Matt Burke and company, because I want to ask what you've, in particular, what have you done since you retired from the NFL? But did you know before that season, in other words, win, lose, or draw, in other words, whether you won or lost in the Super Bowl, even got to the Super Bowl, was that going to be your last year for sure? No, I didn't know. You know, I mean, the last five years I played, I think during the year I was saying this is my last year just because it's hard. Football season is so hard. The yeah. older you get, the harder it gets. And of course. You just, you're just you always in pain, and, and uh, you just say, I'm not going to do this anymore. And then season ends, and you take a lot of 
two, three, four weeks off, you're like, yeah, I feel pretty good. And you're like, wait, what are they going to pay me to play again? Yeah, I can go one more year. Uh, and so you kind of go through that cycle. So I, you know, I learned you, know, you never make the decision during during the season, even though you kind of trick yourself. And say, right, you, know, you only have to do it this year, and then and then you're done. And um, yeah, so uh, but when I was done with the Super Bowl, um, you know, I, I I thought for a long and hard um, because. I wanted to come back because winning a Super Bowl was so hard, but even defending it is even harder. And, right. and like I said, what I just said about John, I just thought so highly of him that I want to do it with him and with that group of guys. And But at the end of the day, at the time, I had six children, and I uh, played 15 years and end with a Super Bowl. I just thought, you know what, don't don't push your luck, Bob. God's been, God's been good to you, and now it's time to uh, maybe take yourself out of the center a little bit and really – you know, really put uh, put first things first, and, and come home and and be with your wife and be with your kids. You know, when you play football six months a year, you're you're basically at work. Right. So, uh, I just thought, you know what, that's it's time, and and uh, end with the Super Bowl. Thank you very much. Absolutely, folks. We're talking to Matt Burke here on Faith and Sport. You're listening to Carolina Catholic Radio. Matt is a former NFL uh, offensive lineman, Super Bowl champ with the Ravens. Played a long time with the Minnesota Vikings as well. Now, here's a big question. If the Vikings are playing the Ravens, let's say it's just say it's a regular season game, who do you vote for? Yeah, it's a good question. I went to the game a couple of years ago. Uh, the game was in Minnesota, so I was probably I was probably you know signaling that I was for the Vikings. It's hard, man. Yeah. It's, it's hard. <laughs> I mean, at the end of the day, I mean, a guy who I wasn't supposed to play one day in the NFL, so to be to be able to play for fifteen years and with those two teams, I'm I'm, I'm indebted to both of them and. Um, love both those organizations, but I would say you know we're living we live back in Minnesota. My wife and I are from here. We loved our four years in Baltimore and loved the owner Steve Bashotti and John Harbaugh and, and everybody there. We and we root my boys. My boys are Ravens fans. They're not Vikings fans. Interesting. I'd say I'm probably just because of, just because of growing up and remembering watching the Vikings right. games with my dad in front of the TV. I'm probably a little bit more Vikings. Plus the Vikings. You know, John, we've never won a Super Bowl, man. It's, it's right. 1961, <laughs> and we're we're long suffering too. So I, right. uh, the Ravens have already won two in their short existence. So I'm I'm pulling for the bike. Well, not that I had to coax you really hard to get on the show, but I probably should have put that in there, knowing that whole thing about the Vikings and your knowledge of the Lions. But yeah, of course, I was born and raised a diehard Lions fan. Do you know this? In fact, even being in the sport, literally, you being in the sport for as long as you have. Even most people that are directly involved in the sport don't know the following fact. The Detroit Lions have won one playoff game since 1957. Yeah. That's, <laughs> that's tough. That's really... But we're not, no, John, though, here's, here's the philosophical question, though. Let's hear it. Would you rather have it that way, where you know pretty much by Halloween that you're not, you know, <laughs> any any hope has been extinguished, right, for yep. Lions fans by about Halloween? That's I mean, right. that Thanksgiving Day game is just... You see all those people in the stands. It's just they're just only there for tradition. They're not there because they think the Lions are. Would you rather have that, or would you rather have the Vikings, where we've been to four Super Bowls and lost them? We've lost two absolutely excruciating NFC Championship games, nineteen ninety eight and two thousand and nine. Yeah, uh, crushed in the NFC Championship game in yep. two thousand and six. I mean, you know, we 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 actually think we have a chance going into January, and then find ways to lose. So, I mean. I think that's a little more excruciating than just kind of the slow burn of being alive. <laughs> but you know what they say, it's better to have loved than lost than not loved at all. But I do understand, and, and you probably didn't hear the first minute of my conversation with my previous guest, Carlos Herrera, in which we said, if you have never experienced like, uh, you know, true uh, disappointment and even a level of certain what I call sports depression, or the yeah. this 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 uh, aspect of winning and sharing in a championship as a fan. If you've never experienced either one of those, then you you can't really call yourself a fan, right? So, well, that's, that's why we love the sports, right? I mean, as fans, we go we go along for the ride. We say, even to the Lions fans, they say, "All right, take my heart, Lions, you can have it." And <laughs> you know, you, you experience the high highs and the low lows, and that's. Uh, that's why we love it. Very good. All right, so Matt, tell us about Matt Burke and Company. Like, wh- why does this give you so much energy? What do you do for those guys? Well, you know, <laughs> you said I'm the now. Right now, I'm the CEO, of Matt Burke. I can't imagine who would be the next CEO. Um, but uh, <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, we, we we do a lot of uh, basically just 
just just try to help people get better, whether it's in their job or in their faith or, or wherever. We do keynote presentations and, and coaching and trainings and workshops and things like that. And at the end of the day, you know, we were just founded the company on the belief that everybody wants to and can do better yep. in some way. And, and, I, and I find it really fun because, you know, you go into a corporate setting and you speak and they'll say, well, and I mean, some companies will come right out and say it. They might know my background and maybe some of the things that I've done or said. And they say, now, look, you can't talk about your faith at all. And I say, I understand that. I will not, you know, directly hmm. talk about faith hmm. from the stage, but we're all human beings, right? We're all... Everybody is wrestling with certain things, and I think they're all, we're all, everything is spiritual. You know, everything, yeah. things that you're going through at work are spiritual, things you're going through at home, and, and that's where our, um, that's, that, that, that's what people are striving for ultimately. Uh, whether it might be to, you know, try to find balance or try to find focus and, or just, you know, and everybody's, everybody's going through stuff. And so it's a lot of fun. Uh, you know, we, we, we get as much as we give to people. Uh, we get to meet great people from from all over the country. About half the half the events I do a year are are Catholic or pro life events, and about the other half are, are corporate. And you know, it's fun. It's 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 fun because we're out there and, and trying to trying to use our gifts to to make a to make a difference in people's lives. Matt, what percentage? You said fifty percent of all your talks are in the um, outside of the Catholic world and so forth. So they're in these um, you know business um, you know. Um, not opportunities, but they're they're in in the yeah, secular secular environments. Yeah, that's right. Secular environments. Of those percentage, uh, I mean, of those talks, what percentage of them does somebody say to you? Don't mention faith or anything about religion. Oh, I'd probably say about I'd probably say about a quarter, um, oh. and they just want to make sure that that I know because I've been outspoken on some things yeah. in the past. I say I totally get it. You know, yeah. I'm not there to. Uh, I'm not there to, to to try to evangelize anybody, at least directly. <laughs> but, right. Uh, I get, and you know what? Probably, probably half the events I do in the corporate world, I'm, I'm hired because the the CEO or the president is is a strong Christian or a strong Catholic, and that's yeah. what they like about me. So they might still tell me, "Don't talk about your faith," but but maybe that's why they they hired me to come in there. So awesome. at, the, you know, at the end of the day, John, just like you, right? You, you you have to be who you are. You have to go where you feel like you're called, and uh, you know some people some people are going to like it, some people won't, and that's. And that's okay. I mean, that's that's fine. We don't, uh, you know, I'm not trying to yell and scream and, and change anybody's mind. And you know, I've been hired before, and then later on, uh, the, the the engagement has fallen through because the higher ups weren't comfortable with with having me and, and what I've said in some of my stances. And that's and that's okay. You know, that's okay. I'm 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 fine with that. Uh, just want to we just want to work with people that that want to work with us, and you know, we're we're called to share the gospel. Uh, Sometimes directly through our words, other times just just through our actions and and things that we do. And so, you know, we're just trying to we're just trying to be who we are. Awesome, folks! You're listening to Carolina Catholic Radio. The show is Faith and Sport. Our guest today is Matt Burke. earned uh, earned the right to go to the Pro Bowl six times, and he is the co-author of the book All Pro Wisdom: The Seven Choices That Lead to Greatness. Now, uh, switching gears, Matt, you, you guys, in fact, a team of people, I want to say it's with one other gentleman, uh, that you're supporting a new Catholic high school in your home state of Minnesota. In fact, I want to say it's right around where you live and where you grew up, correct? That's correct, yeah. We founded uh, co-founded Unity High School, which opened up this fall. And how's it going so far? Freshmen. It's Yeah, it feels, I wonder, it feels like we're doing really good work. Um, you know, I was kind of been involved in education for a long time. I say involved with kind of air quotes, but... Started a foundation back in '02 with my wife when I was playing, and have eight children of our own. And we've moved around a lot, so been to a lot of schools. Really, I guess, given a lot of thought and, and research to education, and you know, ultimately, I think that uh, I think the model that we use to educate our children, generally speaking, is very antiquated. You know, we do not live in the knowledge economy anymore. Yet, our education system highly rewards and stresses memorization and That's regurgitation, right. uh, particularly when it comes to the testing and how obsessed we are with testing. That's right. So, one, I think we're you know, we're trying to cultivate a skill that a lot of times kids either have or they don't, um, but also it's just not very useful. And then you take that into account also with uh, how kids are doing with their, with their mental wellness. You know, anxiety, depression, suicide ideation are at all-time highs. Some of that has to do with the erosion of values in our culture. Some of it has to do with, with technology and social media and kind of the 24-hour 
uh, bullying that might take place. So there's a lot of things going on, and, and I just think that the education model has not changed to keep up with the times. So I was talking about a different approach, and somebody said, well, you should you should meet with this other guy, whom I knew from the Catholic circles, who had already co-founded uh, one Catholic high school up here, which has done very well. And so we met, and we were thinking at the same location. We were mm-hmm. thinking that it had to be affordable, but above all else, that it had to be vigorously Catholic. Yeah, and we agreed on that, and he liked the education model that I was proposing. And it was so it was about a five minute meeting. We shook hands and we said, "Let's do it." And, uh, and God, I mean, I know that God's hand has been in work at this thing since then because we feel we're in a great location, a great parish, which has plenty of space to have us for a long time. We've uh, amazing people have stepped forward, teachers or just volunteers to to give their gifts to the to what we're doing, and they just they just love our love our mission and. And so it's, uh, it's it's been a lot of fun, and we got we got to have a long road to go. It's only yeah. year one, but yeah. I think good things are happening at Unity High School. And at Unity High School, you mentioned that this is the first year, so it's just uh, freshmen, and, and this is pretty typical. I think almost all schools do this, public or private. And then next year, of course, this, they'll move into their sophomore year, and you have a new freshman class. So the first graduating class will yep. be 2022, correct? Am I math The first right? graduating class will be 2023. Three. 2021. Yeah, that's right. That's right. 2023. Yeah. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. And, how, yeah. and how many are there right now? How many in the freshman class? We have 14, which is a great uh, a great number to have year one. And I think we'll grow pretty quick, but our, you know, oh, we yeah. don't measure success by how big we get. In fact, we, we want to stay somewhat small. I don't know. I mean, I'm... Like how small? You know, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking like, you know, 300 students max. I awesome. think after that, you know, awesome. there's a... There's a there's a point where you sort of lose control of the culture where you don't know every single family, right. uh, every single kid, and, and we we don't want to get like that. You know, I think that's part of the problem. That's where you start to lose kids right. where they can start to hide and fall through the cracks. And so yeah, we'll we'll see. Um, you know, but uh, you know, we're we're ecstatic about what we're doing. I think I think I know a lot of people are excited, just trying to cultivate the whole person, if you wish, which all Catholic schools do to a certain extent, but right. we're intentionally trying to cultivate things like virtuous leadership, ethical entrepreneurship. Uh, we're, we're very heavy in the service, um, you know, trying to get our kids to develop and a mindset that, uh, you know, it's not about them, that other people matter. And I think if you're striving for virtue and you're thinking about how you can serve your fellow man, you know, those elements will, will, will lead you to a great life. Absolutely. Folks, we're talking to Matt Burke, former uh, NFL player, Super Bowl champ from the 2012 uh, Baltimore Ravens. Also, you might recognize his name, played a few years with the Minnesota Vikings. You're listening to Faith in Sport. I'm Dr. John Aquaviva. We just have Matt on the line for a couple more minutes. Now, Matt, uh, we're going to do something different than we normally do. Normally, I just shoot another question at you or two, and then we discuss you know, what keeps you busy in life. But we have two questions in a segment that we call the quick Q&A with Dr. A. But when I was writing this up, I said, you know what? I'm going to have the producer, Chris, shoot me the question and I'm going to respond to it. And I would love to get your opinion because this is perfect. I think this is a hot button issue, not only in sport, but in the world of football and in particularly the NFL. So Chris, shoot the question at me. I'll answer it for a minute or so. And then I want to hear Mr. Burke's response to either what I say or just directly addressing the question. Go ahead. Okay. Well, the question is, what should the NFL do to cut down on injuries, particularly concussions? I say there's two rule changes, Matt, that should take place. Now, I played, I'm like a lot of people, I played a lot of high school sports, I played college baseball, I had an opportunity to play year professionally and so forth. But after baseball got over with, I I switched to the world of rugby, and this sport was introduced to me, and I loved it for a lot of reasons. But one of the reasons I liked it was the was the essence was captured in the safety of making a tackle, and and of course we were taught to wrap at or below um, the hips, and we're asked that our head goes to the backside instead of the front side, so a, a you know upcoming knee or thigh can't hit you in the head. And not only was that the way that we, we were taught to tackle in high school, but this was most important in the world of rugby because the play continues on. You probably know a little bit about the sport. It just continues on, right? There's It's called phases, and the whistle doesn't blow sometimes for two, three minutes at a time. And you can make, literally, personally, you can make as much as like five or six tackles in a 90-second time. It's pretty crazy. But the whole time, of course, mm-hmm. you want to tackle safely. 
So both you and the ball carrier continue with the next play. So in the sport of rugby, and I became a referee um, a couple years after I retired from the sport at at, uh, age 40. So I've been a referee now for a long time. And Matt, it is in the rules that if you do not tackle wrapping up, it is considered unsafe play. You can either warn the player or you can directly give them a yellow or a red card, depending on how egregious that tackle is. That's one of the things that I would propose. If they truly, truly, the NFL wants to cut down on injuries, there needs to be a change in how a tackle is defined. And there's, I saw the game last night. Did you watch the Vikings-Cowboys game last night? Where the, And, of course, this happens all the time. But did you happen to see where a lineman literally jumped on the defensive back, put him in a headlock, and drove his head to the ground, and there was no penalty? And it wasn't even illegal. And well, I, so I, I can't disagree with anything you're saying, but the last thing the NFL needs is more rules. <laughs> so <laughs> okay, okay, I'll let me... say this. Uh, one, well, I'd like to say I, I've, I've actually studied rugby a lot and the tackling, and I used to work for the NFL League office. I coach a lot of youth football with my boys. and you know, the, the difference between football and one of the difference between rugby and football is, you know, in football, every inch matters. Every single inch. I mean, literally come down to one inch. And it in does. rugby... It's not so important that you that you stop the guy exactly where he is and drive him back. The most important is just get him down. Understood. Right? But 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 NFL's different. And so I would say this the NFL has made strides um, with keeping your head up and, and really, you know, everything filters down from the NFL. So five, six years ago when they started outlawing forcible contact to the head and neck and you gotta keep your head up. I mean, we've seen that. We've seen a culture change. Yep. What would I think it will continue to get better. Um, is it ever going to be, you know, zero concussions or zero danger? No, but no. that's part of the game too. I mean, the Understood. physicality, right? Yep. That's what makes football so great. So, um, I think good things are being done. I think, you know, everyone's going to keep striving to get better. The other thing too, is we always have to understand is everything, you know, the decisions should all be made in data, right? I mean, based in, in, in data. And right, facts. Youth football and football is not the number one concussion sport out there. It's actually number four behind soccer uh, boys and girls soccer and ice hockey, Interesting. and which is fine. But I mean, football does get a little bit of an unfair share of of blame or the spotlight just because of the position that the NFL holds in That's our right. in our society and mm-hmm. on our sports landscape. Mm-hmm. Um, it's all good. It's all good. I think the conversation's been great. It's ultimately helped make the game safer at at youth levels as well. Like I said, change the change the culture. Um, I do think some of the rugby. Uh, tactics and principles have been, you know, have been put in play. The Seattle Seahawks made that very famous. Actually, they right. they used some rugby principles when teaching, and they were the best defense in the league for a while. So, right. um, it's good. It's never going to be zero. Um, you know, and I, when people ask me, yeah, and I don't, you know, football is not for everybody uh, to play. You know, if you want to watch it, great. But when they talk about their kid playing football, should he, shouldn't he play? I say, hey, whatever your kid's comfortable doing, you know. The great thing about football is you don't have to start playing it when you're four years old in order to have a chance to play when you're in middle school or high school. A lot of people pick it up in middle school. I didn't start playing until the 10th grade. Sure. Um, so when we see so many kids that aren't active or dropping out of sports because other sports require specialization and, and private trainers, and that football's not like that. So football's got a lot of other good things going for it, too. You know, Chris, I learned a lesson here. Um, not, that, not that Matt and I were having a debate on this, but... Um, if it were a debate, I learned a lesson: never debate with a guy who went to who graduated from Ivy League school. <laughs> <laughs> okay. uh, well, I, bar- I barely graduated. <laughs> barely, <laughs> barely graduating is like saying you barely made the Hall of Fame, brother. You went there and you graduated <laughs> from there. I think that's awesome. Listen, what yeah, I think is true. more awesome, Matt, is you took time out of your busy schedule to join this show. This show is obviously important to to me, and I love to talk about sport and faith and. Whenever I can combine them, I think it's a, a bonus. But before you go, I want to give you two big thank yous. First of all, for starting that new high school in the um, St. Paul area in Minnesota. I, th- I think you guys have done great work there. I, I can just tell from you know your on hand and, and the other gentleman that's involved in this uh, process that this school is going to be good and it's going to bring a lot of great um, – It's going to there's going to be a lot of great scholars but also great – a lot of, or I should say, a lot of community and service oriented students. So that's a big thank yeah. you I want to give you. And the other one is just thank you in general for supporting and promoting the faith, especially the uh, the uh, pro life effort. So thank you for all that. Yeah. Well, and yeah, same to you and you, you and Chris and all your listeners and 
well, I'll just uh, I'll just use our use our talents for good and uh, you know, do do what we're do what we're called to do. Answer that call. We all have a call, so I uh, I appreciate it. You know, talking with you is is inspiring and encouraging to me, and happy to do it. Happy to do any time because I love faith and I, I love sports as well, John. I appreciate that, Matt. Thank you for joining us, and we'll talk to you soon. Be well. Thank you. Okay. Well, there you have it, folks. Matt Burke. Boy, he epitomizes uh, the guests we want to have on this show. Somebody who's a yeah. professional athlete, somebody that articulates his points well. Uh, I didn't agree with him on the uh, the football thing, but he's got a great point. Like the bottom line is this: he, what it really what I wanted him to agree with me on was maybe considering removing some players from the field, but not replacing them. Mm-hmm. But I didn't have a chance to talk about that. Um, but he does make a good point. It's not that we don't know the dangers when we go into that sport. It is inherently a violent sport. People do not like to hear or use that word, but it is true. And Matt very kind of calmly mentioned that. Like, this is just the, the you know, kind of the process of the sport, and it's just it's the nature of the sport for mm-hmm. it to be dangerous, and sometimes people are going to get hurt. Right. Well, let's do this, Chris. We got about twenty minutes left in our show. Let's take a couple minute break. Okay. And folks, uh, just stay tuned here. You're listening to Faith and Sport here on Carolina Catholic Radio. I'll turn it over to Chris, but we'll come back with more Faith and Sport right after this. That's right. And we want to mention that if you have missed any of the show today, you can catch an encore presentation of Faith and Sport. Hear this broadcast tonight. At 10 o'clock here on the Carolina Catholic Radio Network. You can also hear an encore broadcast of the show at other times during the week. Also, uh, Tuesday nights at 8, Wednesday nights at 11, and of course on Saturdays from 4 to 5, and Sundays from 2 to 3. So you've got plenty of opportunities to catch an encore presentation of Faith and Sport here on the Carolina Catholic Radio Network, AM 1270 WCGC. We're also streaming. Online at carolinacatholicradio.org and on the Carolina Catholic Radio app. And we've got more Faith and Sport Live coming up right after the break. Please join St. Mark Respect Life Ministry on Friday, November 15th and Saturday, November 16th for an engaging two-day seminar you won't want to miss. The event is called Evolution and the Culture of Death and will unmask the roots of today's abortion movement. We will learn how the theory of evolution and Darwinism has influenced and still influences the promoters of abortion, birth control, eugenics, and sterilization. We will also learn about the Church's doctrine on creation and how it can build a culture of life in our area. The event will be held at St. Mark Parish in Huntersville. There's no cost to attend, and it's open to ages 12 and above. It begins Friday evening, November 15th, from 7 to 9 p.m. in the Parish Hall, and continues Saturday, November 16th, from 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. To learn more, please see the St. Mark Parish Bulletin for details, or visit ProLifeCharlotte.org. Again, ProLifeCharlotte.org. AM 1270 Catholic Radio Charlotte and the Carolina Catholic Radio Network have big plans for you in the months ahead. We're developing six media platforms highlighted by our new Carolina Catholic mobile app. Our goal is to provide timely communication of what you need to know and what interests you most. All content designed to support and encourage you and your family on your journey of faith and daily life. This fall, we plan to appear all across the diocese, from the Eucharistic Congress to parish, school, and pro-life events, and highlighted by our first annual Carolina Catholic Music Night at the Abbey, October 26. On the local program side, Carolina Catholic Radio provides the latest news from the Catholic News Herald and is developing programs with our clergy, parish ministries, Catholic schools and homeschools, Catholic moms, men's groups, and the Knights of Columbus. Earlier this year, we debuted our first local programs, Faith and Sport and Keeping Catholic Real. Carolina Catholic Radio is a 100% listener-supported 501c3 nonprofit corporation. Your generosity will keep us on the air. Please consider making a tax deductible donation or monthly tithe today. Thank you and may God bless you. And we are back here with more Faith and Sport Live on a Monday afternoon. I'm Chris and we're live in the studio. We're going to kick it back to your host, Dr. John Aquaviva. John, I just love hearing that music. I had to hear it one more time before we go off the air today. I appreciate it, but we are going to Coming do it out in the, the break. Outdoor, right? Yeah, we're going to go out, right. Yeah, going into the end of the show or at the end of the show. That's right. You know what's interesting, brother, is I'm the one who hosts the show, but when I listen to you talk or David Papandrea, who did the previous 
you know, segment for mm-hmm. Carolina Catholic Radio, I'm going, you guys need your show of your own. Man, I like to listen to you guys. <laughs> anyway, I appreciate being behind the mic here to do Faith and Sport. Today is Monday, uh, November 11th, and this is the headlines primarily from this past weekend. College football, uh, the top 25, boy, it was a huge weekend. Uh, Iowa barely lost to Wisconsin, two top 25 teams. I thought the best game of the weekend might have been Penn State at University of Minnesota. And Minnesota, mm-hmm. who would have thought, is 9-0 and in the top 10? Mm-hmm. Crazy. And, uh, of course, the big game was, last week I said it was 1-2, and two, but the very next day the college playoff rankings came out and they were 2-3. and three. But LSU was at Alabama, and, boy, they delivered. I thought that was an outstanding game. Um, and LSU won that game, and they're going to vault maybe to the new number one. Either way, they're on their way to the playoff. But, of course, they have to play in that SEC uh, conference championship in a couple weeks. Um, this coming uh, week, the big game is number 5, University of Georgia at number 13, Auburn. Two more great teams going at it. And another top 25 matchup is University of Notre Dame and Navy, which could be sneaky good and sneaky close. So keep an eye on that one. In the NFL, the Panther, Panthers lost to the Packers, perhaps the best team in the NFC. But the Packers were at home, and that's always an advantage. I thought the Panthers gave them a great fight, but they end up going down. Uh, the Ravens continue to demonstrate they are the best team in the AFC. In fact, the stat of the week comes from the NFL. The Giants played the Jets, and I think most people agree, coming into the season, the number one running back was Saquon, is Saquon Barkley. He was held to one yard wow. in 13 carries by the Jets. That staunch Jets defense. And as we mentioned, it, this is a good weekend for the Redskins, Chris, because the the Redskins did not lose. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> but they can't win either, or they can't win nope. when you don't play. But that's always good, because maybe they'll re- regroup and then uh, they'll come out swinging. Now, let me ask you this. I might have asked you this. I can't remember if it was on air or off air. Do you kind of hope that they lose in the upcoming weeks so they can get a higher draft pick? Yeah. You do? Yeah, the way but, things have been going for him. <laughs> but when you're watching the game, it's probably hard to do that, isn't it? You're yeah. like, come on, get a first down, score the touchdown, let's go for two here, whatever the case is. But yeah. I have a feeling the second half of this year might be a long time for you, but yeah. As I mean, was that great that Matt fully and totally acknowledged my pain that I've suffered with being a Detroit Lions fan? Yeah. As much as it is to be as painful as as it is to be a Washington Redskins fan, you don't know my pain, brother. You don't know my pain. No, just that makes me feel a little bit better. Yeah, that's, <laughs> and that's what I'm here to do, but buddy, is make you feel better. In fact, make all our listeners feel better. In fact, that's all. All I have to do is just go. Are you feeling sad today? What's your favorite NFL team? And no matter what NFL team they say, I can go, I'm a Detroit Lions fan. And they just go, you know what? I feel a little better. And you know, you were talking about college football. It Man, that lost to the Whoopack had to the Clemson Tigers. Yeah, that, that was, was bad. Uh, that was do you know what the point one. spread there was, Chris? Yeah. It was 33 and a half points, and Clemson covered it. Yeah. Yeah, they kind of they kind of smoked them. I think uh, when it's all said and done, as we talked about in the quick Q&A with Dr. Ray, I think a couple weeks ago, yeah, Clemson's going to be in it. Mm-hmm. Uh, did you end up seeing the little clip of, with the girl, that kind of the woman, uh, college-age girl that kind of looks like Trevor Lawrence? Did you see that clip? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I thought that was pretty funny. She kept doing the poses looking just like him, mm-hmm. and she scarily – and she was – Good looking gal, but she kind of looked like Trevor Lawrence. It was yeah. she had the same color hair and she had the same headband on. <laughs> I thought that was quite entertaining. Uh, the NBA, um, the Lakers, seven game winning streak ended yesterday. Uh, the Celtics are seven one, but watch the Lakers. Boy, now that they have Anthony Davis, I think the playing field, especially in the West, has been leveled. Um, so watch out for them. Uh, the NBA is off to a good start after just a couple weeks of play. NCAA basketball, the first week was just completed. Uh, Kentucky is the new number one. Duke's number two. UNC's number six. Is UNC is uh, NC State in the top 25? Actually uh, looked at it recently. I can't remember if they're in there or not. No? I, I yes. don't think they're in the top 25. But they're in the top 25 but, in our hearts, right? Yeah. <laughs> All right, because they had a they played a good game against uh, Detroit and won eighty four to sixty five. <laughs> that's actually not, that's right. They played the they played the University of Detroit. Is that yeah, right? That's right. Oh yeah, that's the that's the school my mom and grandfather went to. That's yeah. true. Oh okay. All right, let's do this. We have we're going to run out of time quicker than we think, but we got the Catholic of the Week coming up, which is sponsored by Brand RPM. So we're going to give them a shout out. 
And uh, we got the uh, quick Q&A with Dr. A, the second half of it. And Chris, this is going to take me a couple uh, minutes to answer, but we got to finally get into this. And that is, right. Chris, what? What's the question that you can shoot at me about the NCAA? Hey, I know you're, you're dying to talk about it, so right. let me go ahead and shoot it at you. Do it. Your thoughts on the NCAA opening the door for college athletes to make money. I've been dying to hear you talk about this for the past couple of weeks. We didn't get to this question last week, and now I'm dying to hear it this week. Okay, so let's just set this up. In fact, I think I mentioned this. The reason that we're talking about this, it was, you know, over the summer, the state of California said we should, we are going to, they signed a bill that would allow college students to make money on NIL, NIL, their name, image, and likeness. So that means they can do sponsorships, they can do commercials, they can, their picture can be, they can make money off of a video game, whatever the case is. Right. And the NCA recently said they voted unanimously that they would create a committee to basically set out the rules on how this can happen. And by the way, this is a side note. Some people think that is not really going to happen. But regardless, I've written on this professionally, and I'm I'm only going to give the Cliff's notes from something that I already talked about, but I'm going to directly relate it to the, the current policy on nil, name, image, and likeness. The first thing is, though, there's a couple problems. Colleges and universities provide an invaluable and vital service to our communities, and that is education. In fact, a famous bumper sticker once read, if you think education is expensive, try ignorance. And to address that very slogan, the U.S. Census Bureau, as reported by the study that came out in 2002, expressed this best when they reported that the lifetime earnings for those with a college degree are over a million dollars more than non-graduates. But despite such statistics, essays, and op-ed columns continue to pour in from those who favor paying college athletes while simultaneously refusing to acknowledge or accept the value of college education. And it comes down to this question, Chris. Is college education priceless or is it not? A lot can be said about that. I'll move on to number two. There's problems with payments, and I call it the problems with payments number one. This is going to exploit the process and put into place the NCA and put into uh, place by the NCA and create a like a faux payment of sort for name, image, and likeness system. For example, a booster who also owns a car dealership, when his money the year before would go to recruit, right? We know that that has happened in the past. It probably un- sadly happens currently. The money that would go to that recruit, like a box of money, literally that has happened. These guys have gone out to dinner or lunch with these boosters. They give them a box, to, like, "Hey, take home these shoes," and in the box is cash. Right? This has actually been. This is actually um, has uh, occurred, and some of those universities have gotten into trouble. But now this whole policy is up front, and here's my problem number one, and in, in the issue that I have with it: that five star recruit that top recruit who otherwise may not earn sponsorship money due to a criminal record, poor communication skills, he's not photogenic or she's not photogenic, whatever the case is, that money may still go to them despite the fact that they only earn it through their skill. They don't earn it through being a good steward, being a good community member and so forth. So I think that's the um, problem number one or problem number two, but the problem with payment number one. Another problem with payments is it may bring out some companies that are in poor taste, considered immoral, or in direct conflict with the basic university values. For instance, Chris, think about this. What if the five-star recruit comes onto that campus and and the, the potential sponsors go, listen, if you come here, we're going to allow you to be the face of our company. But what if that site or what if that company is a pornographic site? Yeah. No, seriously. What if that company is alcohol and this Mm -hmm. kid's underage what if that company is tobacco Mm -hmm. any form of tobacco and this goes basically against those values of the university this is going to cause problems it really will yeah and all would agree that cheating example funny funneling money to recruits and current players to some degree has been occurring for decades but this would magnify it in fact put simply it's impossible to envision a, a scenario where this doesn't open the floodgates of universities and its fan base boosters to find out every and any way within or without the boundaries of this policy to slide a stack of cash across the table to the student athlete. In other words, they're going to slide the stack of cash to this kid just in a different way. And what if some of these companies are the only ones that come forward? They're going to have other problems on their hand that they don't envision at this point. Problem number three with payments. This is likely to create an uneven playing field 
between the states. For instance, Chris, in some states, what if one state decides to have a higher tax on those monies earned than another state? Let's say the state of Texas says, we're only going to tax you, say, 10% on those earnings. Mm -hmm. But what if Oklahoma, a nearby state, goes, we're going to tax 15% of those earnings? Where are you going to go? One of them is 10%, the other one's 15%. But what if it's even worse than that? What if one of them's 10% and the other one's 25%? You're going to go where there's only a 10% tax. And this is going to create an unplay, uneven playing field. Mm-hmm. And again, I think these are things that they don't necessarily think about. And I'll end with this note. Problem number four with payments. Money directed toward one recruit or a set on, a, on uh, these athletes may harm college athlete, athletics overall. Here's why. Funds from a booster, for instance, in the past was usually directed toward the football team or the general athletics fund. But under this new policy, funds can be directed to one particular player. And as alluded before, that very booster will get that five-star QB's, that five-star recruit who's a QB or a running B, just a big name, when he offers him a 10 commercial contract to sell cars in exchange for $100,000. This is a great solution for the football team in the short but within the rule and in the rules for sure. But now the smaller men's and almost all women's teams will have taken a hit. Not a good thing in the long term. So in other words, funneling these things just to the major schools is going to shut down these programs. And it's going to, and it might very well kill those programs. Mm-hmm. And I'll make this final point. And it's still the strongest one that I can make for any form of payment for college athletes. Now more than ever, I think we live in an era of entitlement. At one time, our country viewed the chance at higher education as a priceless commodity. However, now it seems that the college education is not held in the same esteem and worse yet, some see it as simply an opportunity to earn money. Although it is now evident that there has been a failure to convince much of the public of the true value of an education, keeping college athletics as pure amateurs remains the right thing to do. And folks, I apologize. Some of that stuff obviously sound like I was reading from a script. And guess what? I was reading from a script, but I I wanted to get (laughs) most of those points correct. So there you have it. That's my take on why we shouldn't pay college athletes, even when it comes to name, image, and likeness issue. So let's do this. Uh, We have one more segment to go, and and this is our Cathlete of the Week. This is brought to us by Brand RPM. Get your branding gear. We have access to over 1 million products. Check them out at brandrpm.com. Dot com. That's right. If you want to get your swag on like Dr. Ray, go to <laughs> Brand RPM. RPM. There you go. Here's our Catholic <laughs> of the Week, the Archbishop of Detroit, Alan Vigneron. He created a document back in the spring in, this, in the Archdiocese of Detroit called the Day of Our Lord. This is virtually a direct quote from that document. After prayerful consultation and responding to what I believe is the call of the Holy Spirit— We in the Archdiocese of Detroit will cease sporting events on Sunday. This means that competitive athletic programs in the grade school and high school levels are called to no longer play games or conduct practices on the Lord's Day, Sunday. In the months ahead, we will offer a number of resources to assist families in their own practice of keeping holy the Lord's Day. More from that document. In shifting away from the hustle of required sporting activities on Sunday, we will reclaim this holy day and create more time for families to choose activities that prioritize time spent with each other and our Lord. As the Catholic Church, our primary role is to form disciples. Informed by and inspired by the Holy Spirit, we look forward to abundant blessings as we seek to abide by our God's teaching to keep holy the Lord's day. That's from Archbishop of Detroit, Alan Vigneron. He's our Catholic of the Week. And this policy has been in effect for just a few months now, and surely there has been some brushbacks from instilling this policy, but I think it is an act of wisdom as well as courage. Thus, Archbishop Vigneron did the right thing. So there you have it, our Catholic of the Week, Alan Vigneron. By the way, I reached out to the Archdiocese of Detroit, and Archbishop Vigneron or his publicists have virtually agreed to appear on the show. And wow. they're going to, yeah, they're going to talk about what is the aftermath of that? What is the overall uh, thoughts from the people in the community and so forth? So I'm looking forward to that. So folks, uh, thank you for joining us today here on faith and sport. Uh, before we go, I want to give a special thank you to producer Chris Pressler uh, for my first phone guest, Carlos Herrera and Matt Burke, the former offensive lineman, both from the Ravens and the Vikings, for joining me on the show today. I'm Dr. John Aquaviva. Please join us next time here on Carolina Catholic Radio for Faith and Sport. And remember, Pope said, 
in sport as in life. Competing for the result is important, but playing well and fairly is even more important. Have a good Monday, folks. We'll see you next time. We want to thank you for joining us for Faith and Sport on this Monday afternoon. And remember, if you missed any of the show, you can hear an encore presentation of Faith and Sport tonight at 10 on the Carolina Catholic Radio Network or at one of the other encore presentation times that I mentioned earlier. And make sure that you meet us back here next Monday afternoon from 2 to 3 for another edition of Faith and Sport live with your host, Dr. John Aquaviva on the Carolina Catholic Radio Network on AM 1270 WCGC, carolinacatholicradio.org, and the Carolina Catholic Radio app. Have a great afternoon, everyone, and a blessed week. Hello, God's beloved. I'm Annabelle Mosley, author, professor of theology, and host of Then Sings My Soul and Destination Sainthood on WCAT Radio. I invite you to listen in and find inspiration along this sacred journey we're traveling together to make our lives a masterpiece and, with God's grace, become saints. Join me, Annabelle Mosley, for Then Sings My Soul and Destination Sainthood on WCAT Radio. God bless you. Remember, you're never alone. God is always with you. We hope you enjoyed the program and will join us back for another show on WCAT Radio. This is Sebastian Mafud. Good day.